Welcome back, lovely souls from the internet. It is 2,023 years since what? What is it? I don't even know. I don't even know. But anyways, <laughs> it's been 2,023 Hello. years since something of what? I don't know. 23 billion or something Lord. crazy. Lord. I don't know. But anyways, we are back. We have had a happy holiday. We ate uh, way too much turkey, gravy, and carbohydrates. We are now full swing into New Year, New Me, hitting the treadmills. Well, I haven't really gone yet, but I've talked about going <laughs> and running on the treadmill. I was dead set on the 31st that I was going to get uh, in shape. Maybe. We'll see. But uh, either way, <laughs> one thing that is consistent, along with most of the world trying to make radical changes to have better output for this next coming year, um, most of the world is pretty pinched right now. You know, gas prices are $4,000 a gallon. Interest rates are skyrocketing. Fertilizers are out of touch with reality, I guess you could say. And as a farmer, one of the most important things you can do is increase efficiency and again, find peak performance in your operation or you might go the way of pagers and end up as <laughs> something that we talked about and pull out for Halloween costumes. We don't want that. We're trying to keep farmers real, alive, and you know, not just something you dressed up as for Halloween. So New Year, New You. New Year, New You, New Year. Same me, same shirt, same everything. I'm probably not gonna change much. I'm gonna try and watch my language a little bit, be a little bit less abrasive, try to be more accessible, and not hurt your soft little whiny hearts. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I didn't even make it. I know, Six you're minutes. Fools Son already. Of a... <laughs> God dang, it's so hard. I just wanna, I just wanna slap fools. I don't really know. You wanna run this one, Sarah? I'm not off to a good start in 2023. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, let's make sure that the chat thing works before we get too carried away. Boom. Hello, David. What up, David and Mendocino? This guy is online. Okay, so we've had a lot of conversations in the last couple weeks, in the last couple months. And I'm blown right past the announcement, Sarah Scamless. Should we just start over? Let's, Let's just, just take start a breath. Over. We're going to start over. <laughs> Boop! We're going to reset. We were not completely ready for this. It's been a whirlwind of a start. That wasn't a refresh. We got, we're new. We got to start new. Okay. We're starting new. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> no, we're gonna do this. We're gonna start right, over. We gotta right. get good tape, man. We can't be putting out junk. Okay, here we go. All right. Welcome back, friends and family <laughs> from the internet and those handful of people that have been on through these awkward outtakes that we're gonna chop for the uh, historical version kept on the YouTube page. We got some pretty good announcements. It's a new year, new me. New year, new you. Either way, it's 2023 years since something happened. And at this time of year, most people reevaluate re and look forward to what they can do to increase their enjoyment in this thing we call life. And when we're speaking about the agricultural process, part of that has to do with yield. But we should probably get into some announcements yeah, before so you, I start rambling. That's the main discussion for the evening. But we do have we actually did sit down and think about what we wanted to bring about for 2023. And so we actually did our schedule for all of our master classes for the year. And um, we have a, um, a list of when our first round of classes are gonna start. And when we say we, we mean Sarah, the organized one of this relationship. <laughs> Sarah sat down and planned out the entire year well, you to know, answer those most important questions. So what do we got up first? All right, so CMBT, that's shorthand for Crescive Method Basic Training. That's where it's a live grow along with us and we uh, train you in the details of the method and you learn all the intricate details of, of of the method and how to steer it and the whys and all that stuff. So that enrollment is actually already open now. And the class starts on February 2nd, which is a Thursday. And it, we do tend to run on um, Thursdays or Fridays in the afternoons. That's when a lot of people from lots of places can actually join us. Um, so that tends to be a really good time for us. Uh, but that's when that particular, the first one of that class will start for mm -hmm. this year. And what goes on in the CMBT? So that's the that's the lowdown of all the details of the Crescive Method, how we implement um, 
implement the method, how we steer the method, the principles behind the method, um, you know, all of all of the things that we talk about on this show come out in very detail uh, in that class. Mm -hmm. so, we do recipes, we soil do, chemistry, mm -hmm. cover the concepts. Yeah. Basically, we've taken the service we provide for our one-on-one -on -one consulting clients and package it into a group setting at a yeah. far lower cost. Yeah, we teach you how we weave all those things <clears throat> together so that you can actually take take your uh, whatever it is you're growing mm -hmm. um, from start to finish with the method and know how to steer it. And then, of course, you have access to us in the forum and all that. So mm -hmm. um, we don't go into the details. Yeah, for a year. Mm -hmm. We don't go into the like you won't learn how to do soil balancing in that class because that is uh, its own class. That's its own class. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole lot. So, um, you know, but you do get uh, we do talk about nutrition in the class and how we use nutrition. We also talk about the minerals and how we use the minerals and and all that kind of stuff in that class so that you can actually do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then uh, next is the microscope course. So that will uh, start up again. The enrollment opens for that on January 20th and the class starts on February 24th, which I believe is a Friday. Mm -hmm. And it'll be in the afternoon likely. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then, uh, oh, and the microscope course, that is a qualitative assessment, but you learn how all of the identification, all of the techniques you need to know to assess um, your soil or whatever sample it is that you're looking at. And then we go through soil readings uh, together uh, in, in the, at the end and the final assessment, you get to see me do a final, you know, an actual full assessment and then what that means at the end of it. Cause that's, you know, that's the meat of it. That's why you'd be doing it in the first place is to actually, you know, what is the soil actually telling you to do and mm -hmm. what do you need to do from there based on what you're growing. So that's the whole point of that class. Um, and then, of course, you do have the forum with all of our classes as well as that one. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, and then let's see, we've got a soil <laughs> balancing course. So that's where um, Scott runs that class. And that is all of the pretty much everything you need to know in order to balance the soil with with minerals, mm -hmm. um, it, with living soil. So you know, we, we know that there is uh, a school of thought out there that maybe mineral balancing with the soil food web might not be um, something that you need to do. We, of course, take a little bit different approach to that. And everything that we do keeps our microbes in uh, in the forefront of our mind. If we do anything that messes up our microbial uh, balance, then we have shot ourselves in the foot. So everything that we do, uh, including our minerals and especially our minerals, um, come with that, that lens of making sure our microbes are taken care of. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, you'll learn how to do soil balancing for your microbial uh, populations yep. there and, and whatever it is that you're growing. So yeah, so I teach you how to take a Malik 3 soil test from Logan Labs or one of the other couple labs that perform that test. Uh, we cover the math, we cover the concepts, we cover the targets. Um, give you a bunch of basic skills to uh, stay alive, essentially. So if you're already a Soil Food Web grad, um, you know, I highly suggest that you take that course. The people that come out of the Soil Food Web world that are really making radical impact with farmers, not necessarily saying popularity on the internet, but like really providing fantastic results are marrying the concepts of the biological techniques taught by Dr. Elaine Ingham with solid foundational principles in managing soil chemistry. Yeah. So that's our offering to those of you that um, you know are already trying to be advisors or if you're a farm that wants to empower yourself to take, take control of that component, that's what that class is about. So we have a calculator tool, we have a forum for support and we meet um, you know, and once a week for eight weeks uh, and then once a month, all students meet um, for as the a group classes, for the master class, yeah. yeah. Kind of keeping that growers group <clears throat> um, <throat> momentum growing and, <throat> and building community. And I was going <throat> to say that with with all of these people in these classes, they're very high level thinkers. Many yeah. of them are very active in the forum. Um, I know that some of them have um, like a, a meetup that they do on, on the regular to do, um, <throat> you know, study sessions and things like that. So it's a very active forum and we're very active on the forum as well. Uh, so, so yeah, and we've got some of the members here joining us today. So yeah, buddy. Yeah. Movers and shakers. I see Becky has joined us. Thank you, yep, Becky. Yep. Good to see you. David King. It is going to be a good year. 
Smiley's yeah. garden. <clears throat> Happy New Year, Smiley. Yeah. So for this, the Crescent Method basic training, we'll be doing three times in 2023. The Microscope Master class and the Soil Bouncing class, we'll be um, doing four times in the next 12 months. So uh, run over to our website if you're interested in that and um, you know fill out the application, do the whole deal. And then the number one thing that's been asked of us that we've pretty uh, sternly denied ever wanting to do and we see that it's actually one of the most important things that we can do and so we took some time over the holidays to prepare ourselves to fully equip our direct competition as consultants because that's one of the most regularly asked thing yeah. of us honestly and um, it seems that it's now time for us to do that so we have uh, put together a consultant training program uh, we'll be releasing those details in the future about that, and that's going to go roughly end of April, you think, or when do you think? Yeah, it'll well, it'll start up in April, and it'll be <clears throat> throughout the year, and so um, yeah. it'll be meeting on the regular, and that's when we'll really go into uh, nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, very, very much in depth on nutrition and um, some of the other things that you need to know to be a consultant. Mm -hmm. So you do have to know the other information from our master classes in order to get into the program because you have to have some foundational knowledge because when you get into that program, you know, it, um, we'll, we'll assume that you have that uh, foundational knowledge. It, mm -hmm. you know, m most of the classes are prerequisites. The only caveat would be with the microscope class. If you have a lab tech certification from Dr. Elaine, then um, obviously that speaks for itself. So, yeah. Yeah. but I do want to say that, um, what we're doing is not necessarily instead of uh, the Soil Food Web program. We're trying to complement the solid f uh, scientific foundational information that's out there and putting it together in the way that we put it together because we're after a very specific goal. And so this is not instead of, this is in complementary to, and we're just weaving together some scientific tools of the trade to, to get an end result. So uh, mm -hmm. that's really what we're after. So. Yeah. And we, we also will be uh, adding an additional course, a uh, masterclass covering nutritional topics, uh, how to formulate um, fertilizer recipes essentially, and the core components for what the different minerals and nutrients do. Uh, so we have some high hopes to put out some uh, badass mofos next year. Jump on the website if you want to be one of those people. So um, with further ado, I guess we could jump into the concepts for today. Yeah. So tonight we wanted to talk about, um, elaborate a little bit on some of the most common conversations we have, um, and they revolve around some core basic components, essentially, mostly in our cannabis work, but all farmers tend to deal with the same issue. And while prices are going out of control and while interest rates are skyrocketing, while diesel is a million dollars a gallon, it is of the utmost importance to find peak efficiency and performance within your farm. Um, it's easiest to describe that as yield. And I think a lot of times people hear us say yield and they think that that's our only focus. And yield is actually one of our last focuses. Our main focus is quality. The consequence is yield. So um, we just inherit yield by properly addressing mineral chemistry, properly managing biological populations, and yield is a consequence of that. So but I use the term yield as a simple description of all the things that most farmers are after. And when I say yield, I mean quality, um, you know, potency in the cannabis world or nutritional density in the food world. And then yield just kind of comes along with it. And there's a couple things we wanted to talk about today that impact yield that most people do that they don't realize that they're doing. Um, and Part of it's mindset-based and fear-based. So a real common thing that we see in our cannabis work is trying to achieve yield through plant count. <clears throat> and <clears throat> especially in the case of cannabis or other agricultural activities where you manage mother stock, take cuttings and turn it into clones, which is predominantly in the cannabis space, most people struggle to perform to produce the yield in living soil systems because they're not properly managing soil chemistry and they're completely disregarding the biological aspect and then trying to just water it with tap water 
because that's what the internet told you to do. And if you follow that protocol, you're going to really struggle to get yield. And, and the initial reaction of the cannabis farmer anyways is to then do more plants. So in the context of cannabis, when you try to flower a higher population or a higher plant count, you're stressing your moms more. You're often putting those clones into a smaller container, which makes it pretty certain that you're not going to hit the yield. Um, and then the plants are put too close together and then they do not yield properly. And I think where that's come from in the cannabis space specifically is in the past years, the early hydroponic cultivators indoor would do sea of green. So they would do high plant count, close together, fairly short, and rush them through the process. And I think this is where we reiterate the thing that we've said in past things that in order for something to be true, the content needs to match the context. And so the context of those past eras is hydroponic tables, completely soluble nutrients, extreme legal penalties for getting caught, and the varieties that were predominantly being grown under that context were very short and fast acting. So a lot of those plants you could take from a clone and put them directly into flowering and they would work out all right. And um, like one, for example, P91 that came from my buddy Randall in Poway in 1991. That's a pretty famous one that they would do high plant counts. They would flip them to flower almost immediately. And it was a legitimate like 45 day strain. Well, under the context of that situation, sure, high plant count is advantageous, but you're not aiming for peak yield per plant. I think it's also important to understand that during that time period, pounds were, you know, five, six thousand dollars, sometimes eight thousand dollars. Under that context, you don't need to hit three, four, five pounds of light, you know, because the profit is in there. And so I think it's important to understand that we're in a new era with a lot of newer genetics, different genetics at least. And if you try to do high plant counts, sea of green, and living soil, you need to be an expert at managing biology, first and foremost, to get the growth rates consistent with that desire. You also need to be managing soil chemistry, produce the yield, and you also need to be supplying supplemental fertilization to allow those plants to make that progress that quick. And what you'll find if you take that path is that you don't need all those plants. So the natural journey of somebody in living soil that actually manages soil chemistry, actually pays attention to soil biology, finds out that the plants very rapidly grow into the lights or grow into each other and it becomes a hot mess. And in our consulting work, it's very common for us to have a cultivator that has previous hydroponic experience, maybe wasn't doing that great at it. And so they're more accustomed to like 16 plants per 16 square feet or, you know, a plant per square foot, maybe 12 plants per 16 square feet. And when we come on as consultants, I will never flower 12 or 16 plants per 16 square feet. And I try to convince them down to four to six plants per 16 square feet. And if you're not hitting the yield marker with 16 plants, you're literally most often offended with my suggestion of going down to four Very or six plants. And yeah. so what ends up happening in our consulting work is it's this like ratcheting down into a responsible level of plant count. And, you know, if they're used to doing 16 or 12, I try to convince them to do six. They end up doing nine or 12. And if they follow the protocol and follow our advice, within a few weeks, they realize that that plant count is too much and it's a complete nightmare. And usually over the first two to three harvests after that change in procedure, they then start to slowly ratchet down. They usually stay at nine for a little bit because they're a little bit uncomfortable. Usually four or five harvests down the road, we might get them to six plants which is my personal most plants I would put in a four by four square. And not one single time in our consulting work since 2015 has that resulted in a reduction in yield. And when we start at 16 plants, ratchet it down ultimately to four or six plants per 16 square feet, um, the yield always goes up every step of the way. And a long time ago, we went to a workshop put on by Dan Kittridge and he talked about this rice study uh, we can do an entire episode on this, but nonetheless, it was a, I think it was a missionary that was trying to help people in a third world country. And, you know, he asked them, what can I do to really help you? And they said, we'd really like more rice. If you could help us 
use your science and technology to produce more rice. That would be fantastic. Long story short, what they did was they reduced the planting density and the yield went up radically. So rice is treated similar to cannabis with clones and they plant them in a single hole and they kind of make like a like a, what you'd see on a dice. You know, they kind of make a grid with the rice. And again, we can do a whole episode on this, but um, the same kind of thing happens with cannabis. What we learned from that experience, and John Kemp covers this in one of his videos, I think he calls it critical points of influence. Yes. <clears throat> it's a great video, you should check that one out. But John Kemp is talking about critical points of influence to the context of corn. And they figured out that in the first 21 days, from seed emergence of corn, it determines how many rows of corn, how many ears of corn per row, and how many ears per stock. So in that first 21 days of that clone, it's determined ultimate yield, and there's other research that um, indicates the same type of concept. In the old cannabis days, we figured out through trial and error. You know, I'm a fairly tall guy. Most of my grow buddies were either fat or very tall, so nobody I knew did massive plant counts. Most of the people I worked with um, had already figured out that when the plants start to touch each other, yield goes down. Um, so but here we're talking about roots. And here we're talking about, yeah. well, kind of everything too, you yeah. know, roots. In the case of rice, in the case of the rice study, I think the plant has a level of intelligence that we don't even give it credit for. So what John is asserting in his study and what the SRI, I believe it's called, um, uh, study with rice figured out was the plant has some level of ability to sense its environment around it in those first 21 days. And from that environment, size of container, availability of nutrients, proximity to its neighbor, microbes, microbes, all these factors that lead to yield and performance, the plant seems to make a determination of how far it can go in those first 21 days. So in the context of cannabis, if you're going for higher plant counts and you're stressing that mom out, cloning it down to the nubs to get your high plant counts, you have clones taken from different locations on the plant, so they root differently. Um, you have usually also subpar nutrition in that mom, so it can't really produce plantlets that will root with vigor and, and yield as well. And so you have this cascade of events that starts with a stressed out mom, varying rooting times, way too much stuff crammed into a small place. Um, <clears throat> in the case of cannabis, you have different rooting times of those clones taken from all over the plant. And then you have clones that sit in the dome too long and some that were taken out too soon. And all of that leads to very measurable reductions in yield. One of the big advantages that most people thought was a major hindrance was the track and trace program in, Cal in, in the legal cannabis states. I'm fine with it. We learned a lot about procedure and the farms that we worked with, we turned that into measurable data to improve our process. And one of the things that we figured out was each one of these little changes is very measurable in a per plant in a per thousand square foot yield. So. In the case of cannabis, you're over cloning the mom, you're producing subpar clones, you got them crammed in too close to each other, you likely have them in smaller pots because you need to fit all these clones into a rack, and you now have a stressed, malnourished clone in a small container determining its peak potential. From that context, yeah, you're always gonna be short on the yield, and I would say 100% of the time, across the board and every single farm we've worked with that tries to cram one plant per square foot is always struggling for the yield. And how many times did they have a loss in yield going into less plants? Every time, pretty much. Yeah. Um, or well, we said that backwards, but every single time oh. there was an increasing in yield by lowering the plant count. But Oh, yeah, yeah. But Sorry. if you're not managing soil <laughs> chemistry and you're not incorporating biology and you do the same stuff and you reduce plant count, yeah, you're going to have a reduction in yield. So what we found through track and trace data and taking very exacting yield data, like literal per plant yield data, laid into an overhead view of a facility and worked back to the changes we made during that harvest, we've learned that. Yeah. Going down in plant count takes the stress off your moms. It reduces the need to take all these inner clones and lower clones and all these garbage ones that you normally disregard. And you put that effort into clones that are more likely to root at a similar time period. 
and you get them into a larger container because you're not trying to cram a thousand plants into a Home Depot rack and magically the yield starts to go up. So if you're going to venture into living soil, the number one thing you need to do is stop trying to force this plant into a miniature container. And it's by a different context now. Yeah, different context. Different you context. want to do different hydroponics, needs. put it in a three gallon pot. Yeah. If you want to do living soil, you know, back in like 2016, 2017, I would say the smallest container I would flower in is a 30 gallon pot. You know, we're now in 2023. I, I, based on what we've seen now, I think you should at least go to a two by four bed and put two plants into that. We found much better yield coming out of a, like a two by four bed than you can get out of, you know, two 30 gallon pots or two 45 gallon pots. And so, you know, if you're flowering in 10, 15, 20 gallon pots and you move to a bed, it's very easy to double the yield. Um, it's very common that we triple or quadruple that year yield over time. And so the biggest leap of faith that it takes for farmers is to, while they're barely paying the bills, consider going down in plant count. So now I'm not recklessly suggesting you just start flowering less plants. You still need to make cultural and procedural changes. You need to manage soil chemistry. You need to provide nutrition and you need to pro provide biology. So plant count is not the way in living soil. Yeah. Not at all, in my so opinion. So if you're gonna if you're gonna jump context from sea of green to living soil, you need to match the context. You know, you need to match that plant count for yeah. appropriate for that style of growing. Mm -hmm. So and managing biology yeah. will be much, much easier. And in fact I I I dare say at this point in time that it's it's almost absolutely impossible to manage biology for long term um, in really small pots yeah. like that. It's just, uh, it's yeah. really, really, really difficult, if not actually impossible. And when I say yeah. that, I mean, it's not that you can't put in extracts, you certainly can, but it's just a different mindset and the, um, the dynamics of a very small pot are very, very different when it comes to um, a, an actual soil food web. Now, if you're just using bacteria, that might be different. But if you're actually trying to utilize an entire soil food web, including the fungi, there are certain dynamics that you have to provide that organism with so that it can grow and survive and live and thrive and have that symbiotic relationship with the plant. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Which, which would be, I mean, in the order of this, presentation is number two, but we would always put number one is if your goal is quality yield, potency, low pest disease, low disease problems, biology is first and foremost first and number foremost. one. And so you're not going to get the growth rates or the yield in a living soil system unless you're managing biology. You might get it one or two times here just managing mineral chemistry or on a fresh batch of soil, but it will not be repeatable. It will not be predictable. And that's the most essential thing in um, in uh, natural systems. So our first and foremost focus for providing the appropriate consistent, consistency and yield output is with the biology. So in the context of living soil and maintaining efficiency and getting appropriately financially viable yields, what would you say are some important components from a biological standpoint, would you say? Well, the when Dr. Elaine talks about ecological succession, she's right on the money on that. Um, that that's the thing that we have seen is that uh, those biological minimums that she's kind of set forth per uh, per crop, or you know what I mean. Um, so brassicas brass, versus yes. old growth forests. Yeah, versus yeah. old growth forests versus yeah. grasses those kinds of things, that that is pretty on the money. I mean, there's a gradient there, but you do need to really come very close to those biological minimums in order to get the results that you really, that we talk about in, in a soil food web. And that means that you actually have to understand that, you know, how to use and how to, to manage these microbes. So I know a lot of people, um, they get, really excited about um, identification of microbes and all those things and they go through the classes and they and they can identify them um, and so when they see one strand of fungi they say oh yeah there's 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 fungi there well but in the context 
of what you're growing, is that enough fungi? Is that going to be supportive to your to the crop that you're growing long term? Will it provide the needs? And that's where we kind of, um, you know, that's where we tease out the differences in the Crestwood Method basic training is understanding all of those nuances that really get you the results that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So with with microbes, you do have to get those biological minimums in all of those categories um, that are necessary for your plant with nutrient, all the nutrient cycling organisms and all of your base uh, soil building nutrient storage organisms as well. So mm -hmm. that is absolutely crucial to getting the yield and the quality. I think uh, one of the important concepts of what Sarah's talking about is what Dr. Elaine defined is as you move through this concept of ecological succession, there's a radical change in the biological populations themselves, what organisms are there, and the ratios of those respective organisms. And we've done a whole pile <laughs> of assessment of everything from literal forests to golf course to city parks of rec to corn and soy to more weed than Jesus. Uh, and... Um, the concepts and the basic ranges that Dr. Elaine talks about is spot on. Like yeah. in living soil, if you're battling thrips, for example, you're almost always, I would be so bold to say always, well below the biological minimums that cannabis needs. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of one farm that we did a microscope assessment for that was claiming thrip damage that was not well below that right. 300, 300 mark. Well, that was the old number. I guess it's now like 150 basically. Yeah. Um, but on the new scale, it's like you're below the 150, 150. And I think what's really interesting in this era in human development is we're really on still in like the infancy of understanding biological systems. Dr. Lane has been trying to push this forward since the mid 90s. We've been trying to push it forward uh, since 2016, 2015. And we're starting to see people want to be aware of biology. And simply getting a microscope and putting images online isn't really what we're talking about. And the real confusing part for most farmers out there is we've got a whole plethora of people that literally put up disease causing or like things that are not correct at all. And we just champion it as living soil. And so it's not just seeing the presence of organisms, meaning it's Something not a living. sterile environment. Yeah. Like, so they see anything moving and they think success. And it's, it's far more complex than that. And it's actually ratios and specific quantities of these things that's the goal. So yeah. it's a weird time right now in human development where it's easy to get misled and it's easy to get off course. And there's people spending millions of dollars trying to get you off course. And so you really want to put that effort into using a microscope to quantify specifically what is there. Because you can look all day in the worst soil in the world and maybe find a piece of fungi. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But and that doesn't mean that you're anywhere near the right. biological support for the plant that you're after. And so, I, I do want to add that um, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that... Um, and, and some of them are influencers or trying to be influencers. And mm -hmm. they... Um, they think that because they can identify, then then that then you know, great, I can identify. Look, see, we found some some living things in the soil. It's not about, it's not just about the identification, the proper identification. First and foremost, you have to be able to properly identify the organisms, but then you need to make you need to be able to read that soil in the context of what you're growing. So, you know, if you're if you're finding this amount of ciliates and this amount of omai seeds, but this amount of flagellates and you know what I mean? So you need to be able to put it all together and take a reading into something meaningful. That's that's yeah. the meat of it. That that's that's what you need to know as a grower is like, okay, I've counted all of these different organisms and this is the diff this is the pattern that I'm seeing. What does that mean? How do I do I need to do something and what do I need to do? It's all about reading the soil, telling you know, getting an understanding of what the microbes are actually telling you. Mm -hmm. And, and that, and that, what crop are you growing? And what crop are you growing? And yeah. so, so you know, very certain populations that are you know really low might meet the minimums for brassica. But if you're trying to grow cannabis, that is not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. Some is better than nothing. Yeah. Some is better than nothing as far as um, 
you know, the, the beneficial categories of organisms, but we, we really, to get to the kind of results we're talking about, you do need to hit at least those biological minimums. And somebody was asking, does it all line up with her numbers? Mm -hmm. I will say that observably, the biological minimums are what is needed or in order to give the plant what it needs and order and in order to protect the plant as well. So mm -hmm. those biological minimums are a must. But what we see is going beyond those biological minimums actually gets get you greater and greater results and yields and quality. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's why we kind of I don't know if any people have seen our bioassays that we show online, but we do give the, the green for minimum and then blue for excellent so that mm -hmm. you know that we really <clears throat> want to get to the, the minimum at, at least at least when we're getting started and then reach for reach for the blue zone. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the excellent if, zone. If you think about it like electricity, right? So yeah. the electricity running through the walls in North America and, and um, some other places is 120 volts. Um, if you go to Europe where the walls operate on 240 volts, your, your, uh, your blow dryer is going to blow up. And so if you, if you, you know, so I guess a less complicated example would say you're in the United States where we run 120 volts through the wall outlet. If you try to plug a 240 volt welder into that wall, it's not even going to operate the welder. If you, um, put a, um, high powered motor for a machining equipment that requires 380 volts, it's definitely not going to run on that 120 volts. So you can take a test light and plug it into the outlet and measure the presence of electricity, but it's not in the quantity and power that that higher level machine needs to function properly. Um, so that's kind of what happens. So if you are identifying a piece of fungi here and there, that might be great for cabbage, but it's not gonna produce a bell pepper or a cannabis flower without bugs or powdery mildew. And furthermore, um, there's a real big issue right now, especially with you know the kind of influx in YouTube and social media. And it's good to see people getting into the microscopes. We have a whole plethora of people that are literally championing disease-causing organisms. So that's like saying you have a, you know, so cannabis is a 240 volt alternating current plant and you're identifying 12 volts of direct current. It's not even the right system, really. It's, it's not even synergistic. And you, sure, you identified an organism that's performing a function, but it has nothing to do with the peak performance or even proper functioning of higher level plants. And so that's a lot of work we all got to do. And that's exactly why we're moving into the training, the consultant space. It's taking too long teaching people one-on-one. -on -one. We're just going to make more teachers. <laughs> yeah. That's the way we're going to deal with it. And that's the way we can provide the most benefit. So those are, those are the big things, you, you know, in order to get the growth rates uh, that people are accustomed to in salt-based systems, and then to ultimately exceed those growth rates in living soil, you have got to have that biological activity in the soil appropriate to the plant you're growing and towards the higher end of those ranges. Yeah. But in the case of cannabis, in the hydroponics world, a lot of the fastest growth rates comes in what they call an undercurrent system. So there's constantly water flushing past the root zone with nutrients in it. So that plant has 24 hours a day, complete access to nutrition you can absolutely meet and exceed those growth rates from a speed standpoint in living soil, but you absolutely need to pay close attention to the relationship and populations of protozoa, which is the predator of bacteria, and then the quantities of predators and bacteria. So you can't get those growth rates until you have a certain population of bacteria yeah. to provide the stability of the nutrition, and then you need the thing that eats it, which essentially opens the bag of fertilizer, and they need to be at a certain uh, population to create that speed. So um, you can absolutely do that. Um, there's another question about balance, but the balances do change. So like a I fungi to bacteria ratio is different for a brassica as compared to a um, old growth forest, for example. But I think you kind of meant, you, you did answer yeah. it. I think what he's saying is for cannabis, it, the green mm -hmm. versus the blue, mm -hmm. it's the same balance for that yeah. crop. You know, when you when you pick a, a success, a, a mark on the ecological succession of the crop that you're growing. Mm -hmm. It's the same balance. We're just saying, yes, there are minimums and 
you get better results when yeah. you kind of go a little a little higher, but yeah. within that balance. So, um, yeah. And, and a lot of people talk about this, like, oh, if you get to 12 bricks, you won't have bugs. And it's like, eh, kind of yes and no. What we've found is when you have adequate populations of bacteria and high levels of predators to that bacteria, then you have a chance of getting into the pest-free zone. Um, we absolutely do it. It does take a proper environment. It does take good soil chemistry. You can't, it's not like we just magically wave a wand and all the bugs go away, but kind of sometimes. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot to the context well, can, of these situations. It but can certainly feel that way when you get it right. I can tell you that when you manage biology appropriately, you at least radically minimize pest pressure and completely eliminate powdery mildew and fungal pathogens like gone. Fungal pathogens, powdery mildew, that is easy work, man. Um, getting rid of every single bug in every square inch of a farm, that takes a disciplined effort, but it can be done. Yeah. Um, but you, you have to very comprehensively address soil chemistry at the same time managing biology. And then if you want to completely eliminate pests, you also need to spoon feed some nutrition throughout the week to make sure that there's not gaps. Um, the example I use is if you're building a brick building and you know three foot off the ground, you change the ratio of the cement that goes in between the blocks, thus making it less strong that's always going to be a weak point for the entirety of that building and plants the same way. So if a plant is building up its cells from the bottom to the top and in week three you had a disruption in nutrition through an environmental impact or a procedural effect or overwatering or something, that's always going to be a weak spot. And so the bugs are going to enter in that layer of the building that was not built comprehensively, if that makes sense. Um, so, And if you don't have... You know, the nutrient cyclers. So mm -hmm. let's say you're in broad acreage and really all you're putting in is you're taking care to do the mycorrhizal spores mm -hmm. and you're um, putting in your bacterial inoculants and maybe you're not using necessarily a biocomplete extract or something like that. You are only going to have the results of those organisms and that's it. If you don't if you don't put the nutrient cyclers back, if they're not there to begin with, especially in some of these fields, most of these fields, I'd say, um, you're not going to get the kind of results that we're talking about because it really does take actually moving the nutrients through the soil, through the system with that trophic, the trophic levels. And you can't, you know, which means the small, the big fish eating the small fish. You have to have the different levels of the soil food web, yeah. that chain of organisms there to cycle the nutrients to make them available to the plants. So yeah, that's another major misconception major, is people yeah. buy a package of bacteria and say, I'm soil food webbing. Like it's an adjective, I guess. It's I mean, like, well, it's a baby uh, step. It's yeah. a baby step, and we commend you for that. Yeah. But um, you're putting, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. There's so much more above what you already think is cool. I promise you. There's, yeah. you know, there's so much more above what people already think is good. You can't even imagine. Um, we call it fish stories because people get almost offended when you say it to them, and they're, and they're like, it's so far beyond their perception of possibility that they're kind of offended by the notion. So that's one of the reasons why we don't come on here and make many claims because most people just shut down and say, I don't believe you. And that's fine. But um, so there are kind of a couple of things we want to talk about as far as making an efficient farm. The third topic um, we wanted to talk about tonight is more of like a, a mindset. And this is something that has come in in the more recent era, eras of cannabis specifically. Um, that I never saw in the legacy markets. And it came with the inclusion of, um, you know, business people and other investors that want to maximize canopy is the word they always say, maximize canopy. And so what you end up doing or what they end up doing, I don't do this. We try to fix this problem and every time try to talk people out of this thing. But a real popular trend right now is trying to win or meet the goal or become a successful business or become a popular cannabis farm by maximizing canopy, which simply means putting plants every damn place. What you end up doing is making a miserable work environment. Um, one of the things that's happening now is living soil is gaining traction. It's becoming more popular and new farms are coming onto the market and they're, they're going after that title of biggest and best living soil farm by doing double decker and putting plants in the hallway and 
you know, putting them everywhere. And I have not seen one single time where that strategy actually leads to the desired output. And ultimately what happens is you make a miserable work environment, you make it miserable for the plants, you make it miserable for the employees. And, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, poop on anybody, but I haven't seen one double decker living soil farm that, that, that looks like it will actually be financially viable. It might receive infusions of cash. It might receive investors, but I don't know. I have a hard time believing that's going to be a good strategy. Um, if you don't go double decker, it's often that people try to, you know, take up all the aisleways and they think from like a bean counter, uh, drawing widgets on a map strategy, and they take away all the aisleways and they increase the plant counts and they put a table here and they put a table there and they put rolling benches. And there isn't one farm out there in living soil that I would define as an industry leader that we should be chasing that's doing any of that. And, you know, we're chasing people like Green Life Productions. Are they doing double deckers? No, he even talks about not doing that. <laughs> and there's even a video on Grassroots uh, website from like 2017 strongly advising not doing that. Like he's not trying to trick you. It makes a miserable work environment. The yield falls off. You end up spending a ton of money. And then ultimately you end up ripping it out. And so we see this a lot in the large commercial work where we've tried to, not we, they've tried to maximize canopy and they've made a miserable work environment, and that is translated into a massive cascade of problems. And um, things that you see a lot is like trying to do perpetual harvest. That's really difficult to get an appropriate yield that maintains financial viability. And so I think what needs to be kept in mind is at least the basic concept of what actually leads to profitability, what actually leads to yield, first and foremost, is a hospitable work environment. And if it's if it's hostile for the employees or the cultivation crew, it's also hostile for the plants. If it's hostile for the plants, you're going to be 30, 40, 50, 60, maybe 100% reduced in output. And I don't think people think about that, right? Let's break down hostile. What is hostile? I think we should break down hostile, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So... Personally, one of the first things <laughs> that I think of when I think of hostile is a very inefficient work yeah. of environment. If you're constantly, yeah. you know, doing, having, you know, just, a, just a layout in and of itself can lead to, you know, really inefficient work, mm -hmm. um, how you work the space, those kinds of things can really lead to people pulling their hair out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's at least one of the things that I would consider hostile. Mm -hmm. We would say, you know, if you're going to do something, do it well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And efficiency is first and foremost for us. But what else would you define as hostile? Well, in the case of commercial greenhouses where they try to put benches everywhere, um, I haven't seen a rolling bench under a living soil bed that worked longer than six months. And so what you end up with is you end up with broken benches. You end up with employees that refuse to do their work, um, not necessarily verbalizing that they didn't do it. They just don't do it. Um, and then and you can't get to your um, job effective, efficiently and quickly in a way that doesn't grind everybody down. Yeah. Um, in the case of commercial greenhouses, what we often see is you'll see like, benches crammed all over here and when we stand up on a chair and look over at the canopy you can see that there's a point where like they can't get to these plants over here and it's covered in powdery mildew um, there's a place in sacramento i can't remember the name of the farm off the top of my head and i probably don't need to single them out but they profess themselves as the most state-of-the-art uh, farm on the planet and spent the most money and owe the most people the most money or whatever and they got all these incredibly awkward benches everywhere and when you stand on a chair and look down at the canopy there's literally like this point where everything breaks out in bugs or mold where they tried to maximize canopy by not wasting space and so i never personally saw that in my legacy cannabis world obviously i've been in wall-to-wall -wall plant buildings um, but under that situation it usually was the farmer that paid for it that executed it and if it was miserable he ripped it out we now have this new world where an investor is forcing you to do something and the cultivator has to do it regardless of if he would do it a second time. And then they put pictures of it on social media and then people copy a bunch of dumb shit. <laughs> and it just becomes this like, 
That's snowball. A it's that's a, a it's, trend. That's a really <sighs> concerning yeah. trend. Not just in farming, <laughs> but like what he was finding out the other day is that it's, it's happening all over as yeah. influencers <laughs> in all kinds of different spaces yeah. um, who m may not deserve to be yeah. an influencer, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's really people are, yeah. oh yeah, that's it, because they see it, they yeah. see it, and they want to do it. And that's just, you know, human nature. But, you, you know, we, I think. I think 2023 is a year of discernment. I'm, yeah. I'm just going to go ahead and say that. Yeah. You got to yeah. be real careful. I think my favorite example is there was this one particular farm, I'm not going to name the organization, but they did a deal with a soil company and a, um, got to be real careful. Um, there was a situation with a farm and a soil company that got sponsored to do this thing. We'll just leave it at that. So there's a farm that was sponsored by a soil company to like organize their facility in a certain way. This was back in like mid 2016, early 2017, I think. They did it one time for the photos. They ripped it out, went back to mills, paying the bills in three gallon pots. I still have people that are designing a living soil facility in 2023 that go, oh, I'm talking to so-and-so about a quote for that goofy ass configuration. And I'm like, please don't do that. <laughs> and they go, yeah, work. no, I saw it on social media and so-and-so yeah, so tried to copy it. And so and I'm like, I've been there. I know the guys. It was fake. It was a money deal. It was a pay to play. They ripped it out. Like, please don't do that. And people that have been to my house as personal friends that have started building facilities still have a hard time believing that that's not the case because you get these big names being, you know, paid for to do goofy shit on Instagram. Everybody starts copying it. And so... It's hard to know how to discern that and the way that I navigated this. So at one point I was an outsider looking in, I became qualified to use the microscope. I provided extreme value that brought me into the commercial scale. And by 2016, we were working with the largest cannabis farms on the planet. And the way that I got to that point was using a tool of discernment. For me, it was a microscope. And so if something was popular on Instagram, I didn't need to call anybody. I didn't need to talk to anybody. I didn't need to be influenced. All I did was replicate exactly what they did. And I could see for myself if it was real or not. Right? Microbial accounting. Yeah. Like the easiest way to discern truth in a living soil system is properly applying the microscope methods of Dr. Elaine or the class that Sarah Scamness is now putting out. And you can tell immediately. We've got another trend right now with a with a saponin product that's remarkably antimicrobial. Um, and if you just sit down and and put a little scientific uh, effort together, set up yourself a little study, and those that have microscopes have taken the saponin product, used it at the application rate, and it's remarkably antimicrobial. So if your goal is living soil, you gotta be real careful with those popular internet trends. It's important to understand that the internet retailers are taking commodities from the outside world that they can make a good profit on and they're promoting a crazy story about it to you so that you buy it. And that's fine. I'm not I'm curious about it. Yeah, I get, try it. You know, I'm not shitting on anybody's, not, it's not yeah, my never. business model. Um, my business model is teaching you how to discern if that's a good thing to do or not. And so we kind of, well, I learned the microscope technique. So before, so I had a pathway to where I wanted to go, we'll say. And being able to quantify biological populations in the soil with any change is what got us to here. Um, and so that's why we offer these classes so that you can, you can do this yourself. You can also do the same type of thing through uh, soil chemistry. So if someone's promoting a different top dress strategy or a soil mix, all you got to do is send it in for a Malik 3 test and you'll know if this is the real deal immediately, right? So an important, 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 important part of being sustainable as a farm and being profitable and producing the output that maintains economic viability is discerning the popular trends and throwing out the trash and sticking with the foundational principles that leads to that output. And um, so, soapbox off, I guess. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> We got a we got a recovering quesadilla extract attic in here, but um, <laughs> too funny. So I guess um, that's all the stuff I got to yell from my soapbox tonight. I'm trying to be more. Yeah. I'm really trying to be good this I year, think you're Sarah. Doing great. I'm trying, you're doing a great man. Job. People are so yeah. soft out there. You hurt their feelings, but. Well, it's a fine line, you know. We're we're trying we're trying to speak truth, teach you how to discern for yourself the yeah. truth, 
and then talk about real real shit. You know, mm -hmm. we've got lots of things happening in the world, and yeah. uh, it's it's real deal out there what's happening. And, mm -hmm. and I think a major part of what we're all going to be up against in this next year is, and one of the things that we teach you in the, the basic training class is that you don't need to get in that fight or flight mode right. anymore. It's actually right. not useful for you. Yep. Um, and and taking on fear from you know what whatever's going on in the world. I'm just gonna say things like media and whatever. Yes, there's shit happening in the world, but you get to decide. You get to decide how you're going to respond to something and arm yourself with the tools in which to respond yeah. in a non-fearful, non-fight or flight way. And then that way you have your wits about you. You can think about what it is you actually want mm -hmm. and then and and go about getting that and know how to discern that. You know, it's it's um it's something that we're going to have to really be careful about is is taking on all the fear that they want you to have and and even yeah. and farming a lot of people get in that fear mindset with farming because they've been fighting bugs and things like that and and it's hard to get out of that fight or flight i know that we've had several um students in the class talk about how relieving it is now that when they have something happen one they can come to the forum and we're there to talk about it real life real time and um, two, they now don't have to get into fight or flight. They now have the tools to, to discern what the next step needs to be and, and what, what, you know, do they need a little bit more information about something and they don't get into that fight or flight and they, they have the confidence and the skills to actually manage it now at, yeah. whatever, at whatever scale they're at. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a... That makes my heart yeah. when we, warm and fuzzy. So. When we first got into commercial cannabis consulting in 2015, 2016, um, we basically went through and just did analytics and provided that information. And what that helped the commercial cultivator do is focus their efforts and know for sure they were into a safe zone. And yeah. some of those, the most meaningful compliments we got in those early years from farmers after applying our microscope methods to their farm was they'd say, I can sleep at night. Yeah. Now. And so, you know, that all kind of translates to stability of your farm, financial viability, consistency, which is extremely important right now. So yeah. applying these tools of discernment to the agricultural process makes it an enjoyable process, plain yeah. and simple. Because what you can you know. see is that the lab results are telling you that you're sitting pretty mm -hmm. and you can observably see that your plant is happy, is is thriving, is doing very well, and you don't need to worry about anything. Everything's on on the rails. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess let's go ahead and jump into some of the comments. We'll uh, go back here and try and find some questions. Um, this is more of a comment, but uh, I want to go back to this because David was there. So yeah, David was here during this time, and yeah, I used to do forty train wrecks per light. I think some of the hazes they would do really high plant count. And Bubba's when I came in and it brought it down to four. So you got a chunker in there. And so plant count context um, and just kind of moving with the environment. Um, we got another uh, Mr. Cub confirming that high plant counts was a problem. Um, he's talking about drybacks. Um, now in living soil, drybacks are problematic. So he could mean that with the high plant counts and the high um, uh, pot count, it became wildly varied from a moisture concept and i would agree with that which is why we don't like doing that but if you are letting a full dry back in living soil you're missing most of the benefit you so won't get your fungi that's you're not sure. going to get the results and you're going to mm -hmm. have thrips and then you're going to spray neem oil and then you're going to impact yield so yep. you don't want to do that um, that's what everybody does but in living soil it's important to understand that you're bringing your media up to proper moisture and then maintaining that moisture you're not fully saturating, drying back, fully saturating, drying back. You're not going to do that. Yeah. And um, yeah, it looks like Josh is important to the... I don't know why some are large and some are small. I'm out of practice, y'all. We'll get this right by next week. Welcome, um, Josh. Welcome, Josh. <laughs> Jump on the website. The and Mr. Cub confirming 30-gallon pots failed him miserably. Um, mm -hmm. It was okay for a little while, but now it's like you can, you know do really good things in a bed. So let me jump. There's a comment down here um, asking about living soil inputs in the two by four beds. So what I was talking about at that time was um, 
If you think about just, a, let's just talk about a four foot by four foot standard light footprint. I know it's changing, but let's just stick to basic math. So if you're looking at a four foot by four foot spot on the ground of your farm, whether it's in a greenhouse or in an indoor context, in a living soil environment, if you go pots, you might be able to cram five or six 20 gallon pots into that same spot. And that's kind of difficult to work. So usually what people do is they do four 30 gallon pots or four 40 gallon pots. But when you look at the volume of soil, so this is all the stuff we have to think about when you go into a big farm. You're talking about hundreds of cubic yards and every little inch starts to really count. So if you look at a four by four space, you can comfortably fit four 30 gallon pots. You can kind of cram four 45 gallon pots and realistically, you should only be putting one plant per pot in that situation. I know there's other people that put a ton of plants into a 30 gallon pot. I don't really uh, subscribe to that notion. Um, you get a lot of variation and some people kind of pull it off, but they're also watering salts. They don't tell you that part. Um, but if you look at the volume of soil of four 30 gallon pots or four 45 gallon pots, and you occupy that same 16 square foot with say two two foot by four foot beds, you're roughly the same soil, sometimes less the soil, less volume of soil, and you can functionally comfortably get more plants in that 16 square foot. So if you picture four 30 gallon pots in a little square, and instead you swap it out for two two by four beds, you can very comfortably now put six plants that have an equal volume of soil surrounding them so that they have equal and adequate access to moisture. Um, they're in a consistent container width and depth. These are all very important components to not have like those four buggy plants that are pissed off. Um, so in a two by four bed compared to four 30 gallon pots or whatever, you get a way more comfortable work environment you get way more consistent planting density. So you can put four or six plants in there without changing a thing. Um, it's very difficult to get six plants in four 30 gallon pots, right? So um, I we started making two by four beds, I don't know, three, four years ago. And you're starting to see them pop up in smaller tent gardens and they work quite well. The only downside to putting two two by four beds next to each other is if you're running blue mats, it makes it more difficult and kind of awkward. So in that situation, you're better off putting a four by four bed. Um, I'm a tremendous advocate and the first person I'm aware of on the planet that tried to make something other than a four foot wide bed. Um, what we figured out once we started adding the living soil liner to the grassroots pots and now with the rain science pots, you don't need a four foot wide bed. When the beds were completely fabric, they had terrible moisture management and the outer six inches of that bed would be completely dry and there's no roots in it, there's no root pruning, and the plants literally don't go into it. Uh, so once we put the living soil liner in the grassroots bed, we started reducing that bed width from 48 inches wide to 40 inches to 38 to 36. The narrowest we've done is 32 inches wide in a flowering environment with success, but that is a little dicey. That's kind of like a 20 gallon pot. Um, it can be very erratic. And I only do something that narrow with really experienced living soil growers. I personally believe that a sweet spot with either the grassroots or the rain science living soil line beds is somewhere between 36 inches and 40 inches wide. Um, you end up with the same plant count. You end up with the same planting density. Nothing changes about how many plants you can put in that row of beds, but you reduce your soil purchase by about 20% which reduces a lot of other things. You're putting less water in there, you're battling less humidity. And the only reason why we have four foot wide by eight foot wide fabric beds is because that's the size of a hydroponic tray. And the only reason why we have four foot wide by eight foot wide hydroponic trays is because that's the size of a piece of plywood. The only reason why we have four foot wide by eight foot wide pieces of plywood is because that's what fits on our train car. The only reason why we have four foot by eight foot wide plywood that sits on a train car is because the wheels and the width of a train car is the same width as the width of the wheels on a horse drawn buggy. The only reason why we have a horse drawn buggy with a certain wheelbase is because that was the size of a Roman chariot. And if you wanted to drive anywhere in the world, you had to fit in the ruts of a Roman chariot. And the reason why the Roman chariot was this wide is because that's how wide 
the ass of two horses is of which was drawing that thing. So in 2023, if you're running a four foot by eight foot wide bed, you're doing it because that's the size of two horses asses. Think about that. <laughs> Think about that for real. So we don't do that. So we start, <laughs> you might as well be pretty sacrilege by trying to narrow that width. Now in certain situations, like the homeboy David is saying, who comes from the Mendocino area with a tremendous pedigree, in that context, the six foot wide bed works really well. Why? Because it's hot there and it's dry there and you need that soil volume size to have stability in that bed when it's on the ground. Now that again, break my back. now break again with, wide. again, so now with newer technology of living soil line beds, either from grassroots or rain science, you don't need to go that wide anymore. In a, in a hot Mendocino greenhouse, I would probably not go narrower than 38 inches wide, but I would still cut it down to 38, 40, or 42 inches wide. I'm the last person on the planet to do a four foot wide bed in 2023. Um, so just some things to think about, um, you know, as far as like bed width and max efficiency of soil. Uh, a proper living soil is quite expensive and diesel fuel is god dang $7 a gallon right now which makes shipping of that heavy our soil. So it's very expensive. So if you can reduce your soil purchase by 25, 30% and not make any measurable change in output performance or consistency, that's a no brainer. Um, and in an indoor cannabis, cannabis environment, you're putting less humidity in the water. So, so yeah, let's see. Um, and we're not mad at you, David King, for trying to maximize output on the journey. And part of that step is maximizing canopy and plant count. And I'll be the first to admit that in my first living soil grows, I put more plants in there. But again, I come from a science-based mindset. Um, and we the very first living soil grow that Sarah and I did together, we did a science test. So we bought a tray of clones. Some of those plants we put directly into their 30 gallon pot because that's what we were using at the time. So we had a clone go directly into a 30 gallon pot. Um, we took some of those clones, put them into a two gallon pot, later transplanted them into a 30 gallon pot. We um, did two plants per 30 gallon pot and we did three plants per 30 gallon pot all in one run, kept them separate, changed no other variables and measured the output. The plant that we took the clone and put it directly into the 30 gallon pot by far had the highest yield and actually had more yield than the three plants per 30 gallon pot and more yield than two plants per 30 gallon pot. And we've never turned back. Um, so, so planting count, planting density matters, matters radically. Yeah. So repeat the study on your own. Most people don't set aside variables to measure one minor change to see most people are just frantically thrashing through the process. And the cultivators that we've worked with that you would define as industry leaders and respectable oftentimes do that. And most of our work is guiding those types of farmers through that process. So, um, and it is, it is the proteins, man. And that's an old throwback <laughs> joke. Um, I grew up in a very Hispanic uh, area of Southern California and I had predominantly Hispanic friends. And one time we were sitting around the hydro grow and I asked, why do we need this product? And the homies just kind of took for a minute, hit the joint and he goes, plants need the proteins, man. And they do, he was right. And that was the day <laughs> I went home and researched, do plants need proteins? And what was the importance of proteins in plants? I learned that sulfur and calcium join together to make complete proteins. And when you don't make complete proteins in the plant, you get spider mites. So he, I don't even know if he knew he was right, but he was right. Um, and that's what we teach in the classes. So um, I would agree, David King. None of my mentors from that 2009 to 2012 era did anything radical that people regularly do now. And I'm not saying what they did was delicious. Um, you know, they would light off a purple raid bug bomb week to a flower, but that was the only step for pest management. Um, you know, I think a lot of that was at that same time period, there was a lot of shit that changed from 2009 to 2011 in Southern California specifically where I was involved in. And one of the major changes was uh, they moved to vented hoods so that we could keep the grow room cooler and they were cheap and Chinese and didn't seal out. And those inline fans that 
sucked the hot air out, sucked the um, CO2 out, and um, yields went down and bottles of CO2 got emptied. So the hydro stores started suggesting running completely sealed rooms. Everybody I learned from ran air exchange on their indoor rooms. I didn't know one person that ran a sealed room. And some of those people that I originally worked with and learned from in 2009, 10, 11, 12 are still respected as industry leaders. One of those guys went on to build one of the largest farms in the entire state of California. Um, so air exchange is extremely important. Um, I think during that same, same era around 2010, 2011 is when the market became so big that it became less direct to direct. Like you had to know a guy, be qualified, be vetted, be approved, and be invited in to grow. And that was how it worked prior to that point. And what I call the Prop 215 com comfort era was when you could stack 99 permits and grow a thousand plants and not worry about getting raided. At least in Southern California, we're not getting raided. Um, there was lawsuits and all, like you could pretty much do whatever you want during those few year period. And that created a massive influx in growers that their mentor became the hydro store, the guy that's trying to sell you shit. And that's when things went haywire. And so we need to get back to having close personal relationships with qualified growers, whatever that may mean, that can guide people on successful paths and stop being manipulated by those that are just trying to sell you shit. So the way we do that is through methods and tools of discernment. I prefer the scientific basis. You all can do whatever you want. Um, so yeah, and I appreciate you too, Brendan. Brendan. Um, so uh, let's see. Hey, that's pretty cool. Good to see people growing food. That's most important. It so. does. It does. I tell mm -hmm. you what, my yeah. my <laughs> my tomatoes are off the hook. <laughs> off the hook. They're typically <laughs> as tall as the um, as my roof, typically. Yeah. So. Yeah. And Becky knows what's up. Becky is a soil food web grad that is uh, going to be a professional advisor. So that's pretty cool. And she's about to learn the upper limits of biological farming. So Mr. Cub, you saying you were flowering in bottomless pots? Was it on top of a bed or just without a bottom? That would be kind of interesting. Um, oh, bottomless pots on beds. Oh my I got you. So this is a fun question. Well, I, we don't have a, a image queued up with this, but do you want to answer I this I do one? have an image of it though. <laughs> um, so how do microplastics affect the soil food web? Well, we have seen um, some of these microplastics get taken mm -hmm. up into uh, the shells that we call a testate of the amoeba. So they were finding them <sighs> definitely in the soils and uh, in some of those uh, amoeba in their shells. Some so, crazy pink yeah, and purple it, and neon mm, blue colors. It's yep. like, oh my God. But I'm happy with that because to me that says an organism is working on our problem of producing way too much plastic. Or is it like that? Or is it a straw in the nose of a turtle? <laughs> I mean, I guess time will find out. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, there, you know, I, some of our clients are, um, uh, dealing with some of these toxic wastes um, in in their management systems, and even some of the trees are tying up these toxic these toxins into their uh, bodies. And then when we chip them, it's now in the bodies of the trees. So mm -hmm. now your wood chips are full of these these things. And mm -hmm. so um, yeah, just yeah. we're kind of creating a, a mess. So. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you can be part of the solution, and that's what this is all about, so. Yeah. Let's see, just cruising through here. Um, well, that's a really interesting fun fact. Latest Dutch studies recommended air exchange is mandatory. i got to talk to those oh. guys to stop copying me. I've been saying that. <laughs> I've been saying that on YouTube for years. That's the first thing we do in a commercial project, and for a long time we would not take an indoor project unless they had air exchange, the ability to put in air exchange, and we're willing to put in air exchange. That's how serious I take it. And the Major General knows what's up. Purple Raid Bombs. It did work. I'm not saying it was delicious. Um, but it was nowhere near this, like, every two days spraying shenanigans that's happening right now. Like, we got to back her down. Nutrition works, We got to back her down, man. Yeah. We got to back her down. So, let's see. Um... So I guess we're getting kind of towards the end of the questions. Um, doesn't look like there's any other, some good conversation in the chat between the homies, which is good to see. 
Um, so yeah, I think we, I think we did it. Do you have any other uh, final inputs to throw in there and leave the homies? You got wise words of wisdom? Anything? Uh, just that, you know, you are the boss, Applesauce. So it's you're the captain of your ship. You get to decide mm -hmm. what what kind of results and what kind yep. of path you want to travel this next year. So um, our advice is going to be use science to discern to discern the path, you mm -hmm. know. And and I would say expand your mind about what you think is possible. You know, we're really we have humans have an uncanny ability to. Uh, beat you know want to break out of any limits and i would say that we have yet to discover like becky was saying we have yet to discover Not what always. that ceiling is yeah. for these crops both in nutrition quality yield and i'm all for that journey um definitely throwing our hat in the ring and we hope you will too yeah i so. i would say like most people like we've got some radical changes in technology that are bringing about better outputs and most people view that as incremental movements of increase. I still firmly believe everything that we do is still limiting the peak potential of the plants. And I would say that we have not, and even our top 1% of all cultivators on the plant that we work with, um, we're still doing some degree of limiting the true potential and inherent potential of the plant. And we're only scratching the surface yeah. of what they're actually capable of and we're starting to unlock a lot of that peak potential through the management of soil organisms and biology, thanks to the work of Dr. Elaine and those of us that have taken it on to the next level. Yeah. Um, and I would so, say that echoes for humans. We have yet yeah. to, di to discover our peak potential, um, mm. but I can tell you it won't come with fear. Yeah. Fear will not get you there. That's a limiter. And so we've got to find ways to, um, you know, choose choose what we want in our world and um you know we have we have great potential and and i know that it doesn't look like that it looks like a complete shit show but there's a <laughs> lot of things that need to die and a lot of things that need to self-destruct mm -hmm. um yeah. in order for that potential to be reached so yeah. don't don't limit ourselves and microbes will be part of that i mean what's going to happen when we actually inoculate ourselves with the right yeah. nutrients the right microbes all those things so mm -hmm. uh i'm i'm for that future yeah so and i i would agree david there's at least half again more there's at least half again more yeah um because most people do one thing well right so usually if you have somebody that's a respectable cultivator either through quality yield or whatever or profitability they're usually good at one thing they become really good at procedure they become good at managing workflow or they get good at canopy management or they get good at genetic selection or you know they're usually good at one aspect and that holds them above the rest of the population that's maybe average at certain activities um, when we take a farm and we put them into an expert level of managing soil chemistry and an expert level of managing soil biology it's absolutely ridiculous what happens. And I think what's unique about us, and I would say Nick Tomasini as well, is the only other person I'm personally familiar with in the commercial space that is is has a comprehensive expert knowledge of multiple topics and all the things that are necessary in, in, in the cannabis space to be successful. There's very few people that try to even become competent, let alone expert, at the needed aspects of agriculture. And I assert that in order to be profitable, especially in the cannabis space moving into the future, you need to be at minimum proficient at managing soil chemistry and proficient at managing biology, mm -hmm. as well as being at least in a decent farm manager. Um, you know, that's just my personal thing. And, you know, then you start getting into nutritional management and there's a whole, it's just the sky's the limit, y'all. Um, but, you know, we need to, um, we need to be more interested in building competency in the various aspects of agriculture. And I come from a sports background where we went to a hitting coach. We went to a pitching coach. We had our main season. We had our summer travel ball. We had our all-stars. And so I came into agriculture trying to identify the aspects that are needed to be successful and then sought out the teachers that could teach me those aspects 
learn from them, and then build upon those to get to where I am now. And that takes a certain mindset. It takes a certain like a mindset. Surrender to yeah. the teacher and be like, okay, yeah. you know. And I think a lot I'm of people. Not surrender, but you know, yeah, what I'm and saying. I think a lot of people think that we're only out there doing Dr. Elaine's technique, and that's just one component. It's a core component of decision making. Absolutely. If we come up with an idea and it reduces biological populations, the idea is out. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of the main component, even though it's only one component, but we teach mineral chemistry, we teach nutrition, we teach biology, we teach procedural, you know, we teach every aspect of it to build qualified, professional, comprehensive cultivators. That's what we do. And that's across all crops. We've worked with city parks, we've worked with golf courses, We've worked with thousands of acres of agriculture. We just like hanging out in cannabis while we wait for the rest of agriculture to catch up to the level of performance that we're getting in the regulated cannabis space. And that's happening now. That's happening now. Yeah. Um, so, so there you go. Um, you want to answer this one or hit the, uh, hit the, the, hit the beeper? Which one? This one. <laughs> oh, neem oil versus microbes. Man, We've had so many episodes on that. I'm not sure we need to talk about it, but to, it's yeah. not good. The, the, main, the main component <laughs> is it's one of the most antimicrobial things you can yeah. spray in the cultivation space, regardless of what the Internet says. Um, we've done side-by-side -side trials where we sprayed one greenhouse but not the other one. Yeah. Um, there's, a, you know, in that particular trial, we sprayed one greenhouse but not the other one. There was an 85% reduction yeah. in soil organisms with one light, moderative spray that led to a 25% reduction in yield with nothing else changed. So, you know, in order to get peak performance, stop with all that. And it's not just neem oil. It's anything that you spray in a living soil environment mm -hmm. that's antimicrobial. If you spray a systemic fungicide like Eagle 20, for example, the plant takes that toxin, tries to deposit it into the root zone to get it away from its biomass, which then kills everything in the soil. Yeah. Um, you think, know, so. think we're trying to be more like direction and yeah. broad thinking of concepts and principles versus being so dogmatic about against one evil thing. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's really kind of a, a concept and a, a philosophy of moving with life and letting life guide you. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if you're killing your microbes, well, if you had a whole bunch of OI seeds and you, and you needed to reset the system, that's what you're going to get is you're going to yeah. get a reset. Um, so you better want that if that's what mm -hmm. you're um, using. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just knowing those things and you don't know them until you track them, you know. Right. And that's the thing is people get all hung up and feel like we're looking up their skirt when they get their first um, bioassay, <laughs> you know. But at, at, you don't know until you till you look and you can't make any um, corrections in, or any meaningful corrections until you do. So Right, right. So there you go. You did it. So, uh... In short, we're using scientific tools to recalibrate the most sensitive um, instrument on the planet, the human being. So yes, we're you know we're not <laughs> saying science is it. I'm saying that the human has the most sensitive um, tools at its disposal. We've just lost the calibration procedure. Yeah. So we recalibrate the human using measurable scientific tools, and then we go from there. Reset so, the bar of what is possible. What is possible. Yeah. And on that note, um, we will see you next week, hopefully. Maybe the following week. I don't know. We'll let you know. But we'll thanks for stopping in. And uh, we'll see you next Till time. Till then, take care. Thanks for coming.